I'm Gail Sylvia, and you're watching sylviaglobal.com. We're a broadcasting network that's affiliated with Sylvia Global Media Network. This broadcast is about Operation Reinvent, and I'm extremely excited to introduce to you a new host on sylviaglobal.com, Julie LeWitt Nuremberg, and she is the founder of Operation Reinvent. Many of you will know and associate Julie with the publishing industry, especially the um, beauty industry um, and magazines in that publishing um, sphere. Uh, she has been the past publisher of Marabella. She is also a publisher of Mademoiselle. She also owned Mode um, Magazine. She has been affiliated with Ms. Magazine, among many more. It's quite a distinct honor for us to have Julie joining us because she's now bringing her skills and her talents to serve the women in the U.S. military with Operation Reinvent. Julie, thank you so much for being here with us today. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me on your show and uh, giving me the opportunity to actually host my own show, which I think is a great honor. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you. We feel especially honored both in having you but bec and, and because you're bringing with you attention uh, that's needed, much needed, for women vets and embracing women in the um, women veterans from the time they leave military service until the time they've successfully reinvented their lives and transition into a new normal. Uh, before we go into a deeper discussion about Operation Reinvent, let's talk about you and your background so that our audience can understand um, why we're so honored to have Julie LeWitt here on Sylvia Global. Thank you. Well, um, it's actually um, I spent most of my career in the magazine publishing industry and it started when I was hired by Gloria Steinem to be part of the uh, original team of Ms. Magazine and uh, that experience really focused me on women's issues and the opportunity to empower women through the most important way at that time which was through magazines. So with Ms. Magazine, um, we actually, uh, the credit all goes to Gloria um, because she was the instigator of all. But we changed the world of publishing, basically. And, um, it, um, and that started me on a road of, of implementing that kind of mentality and that kind of thinking as I moved from magazine to magazine. So just to give you an example, with Mirabella, which was really a high style, high fashion magazine, what I was fighting for is against ageism. Uh, because all the fashion magazines were featuring 14 year olds and that was supposed to be the only way that you should be is jumping over things and being incredibly skinny and, uh, and 14 years of age. And we felt, I felt very strongly that style and fashion has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with age. That you can be fashionable and stylish at 27 or not, and you can be equally stylish and fashionable at 72. And what we, what we promoted and talked about is the fact that age has nothing to do with style. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And when I launched my own magazine, which was Mode Magazine, the first Vogue quality, fashion style magazine for women women of size, size 14 and up, we again flew in the face of, of preconceptions and perceptions that women of size do not care about how they look. Well, guess what? They do. And in fact, there are as many size 18 and 20 women who care deeply about how they look, about their hair, about their makeup, about their nails, about their clothes, as there are women who are size 2 or 4 or 6. So size has nothing to do with how you want to look and how you want to present yourself. So um, we felt that here was an audience that was really relegated into a corner, into a very, very bad corner of being dismissed and isolated and discriminated against because of their size and we felt that that had to be changed and we felt very strongly about that and we created a magazine that was incredibly successful because of that. 
because we embraced her as somebody who is important. Ju you uh, made reference to Ju um, Gloria Steinem being an instigator. It sounds like all significant change that occurs in the world comes from someone being an instigator. In this case, um, explain to us how the landscape changed noticeably with Ms. Magazine and the influence that that had not only for women but for the beauty industry, upon the beauty industry and in the publishing industry. Well, you know, this goes back, we just celebrated our 40th, uh, actually 40th anniversary of Ms. being launched last year, so it's, no, a, a year and a half ago, so it's now 41 and a half years ago when Ms. Magazine was launched, so it's a long, long time ago. So Ms. Magazine is now middle age. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it really is. Uh, but with Ms., uh, it was very interesting. You know, um, the way we changed it, our publishing industry. Firstly, we were the first magazine that actually had women sales representatives, advertising sales representatives. Until then, every magazine only hired men to sell advertising space. So we were the first group of women who went out there and sold advertising. Wow. It's huge, huge. The things that we take for granted now. Absolutely. The second thing was is that we actually asked advertisers to change their copy. To How be was less that discriminatory. For example, at that time Eastern Airlines had was the wings of man. And we asked them to change their low they change their ID tag from the wings of man to the wing, wings of humanity, or being a, wings of humans, or, or, or to change right, it from right. a way that was not only male yeah. oriented. So it would be more inclusive. More inclusive. Uh, we asked advertisers, uh, we actually um, um, did not accept advertising that made fun of women and stereotyped women as the low housewife who cannot do anything without her husband's help. Um, we made sure that we actually had articles that were incredibly um, incendiary at that time about abortion rights, about women's rights, about women's rights to their body, uh, about women making decisions about their bodies, uh, with our bodies ourselves. We launched many, many writers in this world of pro-feminine writers which are now, you know, it's, it's not even an issue anymore. So uh, Ms. Magazine changed the landscape of publishing for, for women and, um, and women's magazines. How do you know when, you're, when your role and work is done? you've been able to transgress through the publishing industry or to maneuver through the publishing industry in such distinct ways and each time elevating not only your own um, career presence but elevating the presence of women and how women are viewed. So when, you're, when you enter those arenas, Julie, how do you, do you have an exit strategy or a way of gauging that your work is done, your mission is accomplished, and it's time to move on? No, there is no exit strategy. <laughs> because our work, your work is never done. I mean, take a look at abortion rights again. It's being debated again, again and yeah. again and again in every in, in many many states where there it is uh, it is our right to have control over our bodies. And it is now 40 years after the Roe versus Wade was passed, or less, less than 40 years, 35 years. And yet again, it's part of every conversation, every political conversation, every, um, every time somebody runs for office, abortion rights come up. So yeah. is, is our job finished? No. Yeah. Um, How women are depicted finished? in the media. It's, and even, we still have the, the issue of um, perception of what women should be how we should be perceived and presented in the world um, within the industry. It seems to be an ongoing um, battle, so to say, and but yet progress does seem to be made. 
progress is being made. I mean, let's face it, with Mode magazine, uh, we actually forced um, the, uh, the design community to start creating beautiful clothes for women of size. And there are many, uh, there are many um, designers who actually uh, rose to the occasion and created beautiful, beautiful garments. So they understood that women of size have money and they do care. But they didn't have the clothes available for them prior to that. And oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I I, I just want to add that, uh, especially uh, you know, there are certain communities where women of size are cherished yes. and and are, and felt to be curvaceous and sexy and um, desirable. I mean, never in a magazine we, t we really glommed on to that philosophy. I and mean, we never ever used the word fat. We never used the word diet. We never used anything derogatory that had an adjective of larger, large, greater, bigger, any of those words. Taboo. We, we refer to these women as sensuous as curvaceous, as desirable, as beautiful, as sexy, as having, you know, that kind of presence and being out there and, you know, just looking terrific. And our readers loved us for this. Loved us for this. Still why, did, us. why did this become important to you? What's your, what experience in your personal life, you know, was it growing up? Was there a defining moment that you realize that um, your interest in beauty and self-value um, needed to be conveyed and expressed um, to others to encourage and inspire them. Well, if you're asking me if I had an aha moment, I didn't. Okay. I, I really did not. I, I cannot tell you why. I cannot tell you what brought me into this world. I know why I entered the veterans field, which is a, a, a very different route. Um, I cannot, I, I really always felt that as a woman, um, and having been on my own since I'm 19 years old, which is a long time ago, by the way, um, I, um, I felt that, you know, I should have the right of, of having everything that somebody um, who is born male should have, and I felt that that's to, that's to be true for every woman. So I was raised very independently, not by choice, but because by necessity. How, I, how did it, the, you enter the work with Operation Reinvent in the veterans world? Well, that's a, a little bit longer story. I was actually doing a project for Rebuilding Together which is a very, very honorable and very good um, uh, organization out of Washington that helps um, um, rebuild homes for the elderly, for the indigent, and mm. in some cases in a, uh, they had a very small program for veterans. And I was asked to take a look at where we could come in, what I could do in order to uh, expand their um, possibilities. And I, I noticed that the veterans program was a very small program supported by Sears. It was a great program, but was only a very small part of what Rebuilding Together does. So I said to myself, you know, I'm, I'm basically a marketer, okay? So I look at openings and I look at voids in the marketplace. And I said to myself, hey, you know, here's an opportunity for Rebuilding Together to do something much bigger for veterans. And I came up with a program which everybody loved. Uh, it shall remain nameless because um, things changed at the organization and the whole thing was kind of tabled. But during, uh, during this um, uh, time when I was developing the program, um, I actually had the opportunity to uh, witness one of the rebuilds in Harlem on 107th Street and between Lexington and 3rd Avenue. It's a small street and they're rebuilding a men's shelter. And it's a one-day affair. They come in in the morning, 150 people, electricians, plumbers, painters. I mean, it is all over. Everybody's working like crazy. And at lunchtime, um, they closed off the street, and I sat with a group of men at one of the tables. And they turned out to be veterans, um, male veterans. And I was asking them about, about their stories and what's going on with them. 
And I gotta tell you, I I started to cry, and I still do because it was it was so awful. Their stories, okay? They they really here are people who served us and who who gave so much for us, and who cannot get any of the services. It takes them years from the Veterans Administration to get any kind of service, and. I said to myself, you know what, this is not okay. This is absolutely not okay. And But as you know, some people have a calling. Uh, sometimes the calling calls on you. And I felt, okay, I am not a veteran. I have no, I don't know anybody. Yes, I do know some people who are veterans, um, but very few. And in my age group, they are veterans of the Vietnam War, which uh, the veterans of that war were treated even worse, um, which I did not realize. Um, and I said to myself, this is it. I want to really get into this into this space. And then I, again I looked and I said to myself, you know, I can't really make a difference here uh, among, uh, for, for the men because there are so many veterans organizations um, that actually serve veterans. But I noticed that women veterans are getting really short shrifted. And they are treated really uh, in, uh, there's a in, there's a huge inequality in the way women are being treated, and there are very few organizations that exclusively focus on women veterans. And as you and I know, women have very different needs and very different um, I wouldn't say problems, but challenges and also opportunities that um, they're different from their counterparts. But just to give you an example, still unemployment among women veterans is 66% higher than among male veterans. The homelessness, albeit is a very small part, is still four times higher than among men, male veterans. Wait, I'm and sorry. Did you just say that the homelessness rate among female vets is small within what context, but still higher in what context? Uh, it's uh, the the total numbers are small for both groups. Okay, it, oh, relatively oh, yes. Okay, the homelessness is not a huge number of people. However, among women veterans, it's four times higher than wow. among men. Wow. Okay, so it's not it's not so much a um, numbers game, but it's really a uh, multiple of those numbers. So Operation Reinvent advocates for women vets. You're actually the only full service program that is exclusively dedicated to women veterans, correct? No, we are not the only one, but we are the only one who does one thing, and that is to prepare women veterans for the right job. Okay. So talk to us about Operation Reinvent and how that came into existence. Okay. Because you were the instigator. I was the instigator. And, um, you know, it took us, I started the Operation Reinvent program, thinking about it, looking at it, seeing where, what is missing, uh, about almost a year ago. Um, and what I found is that what is really, really the crux of it all is to be able to get a job, but not just any job, because what we are talking about here are women who are probably the best educated, mm -hmm. the most skilled, the most dedicated, motivated, having incredible leadership qualities of any generation of women veterans. So we are talking about probably the finest women that this country ever produced. And these are the women who deserve, in turn, the finest that we can offer to them. So our philosophy, our policy, what we are all about is to get these women, to help these women get the right job. Not, with all due respect, not to be a sales clerk or a greeter at Walmart. That's not what we are about. What we are about is getting her the kind of job that suits her skills, that suits her experience, that suits her heart and her passion, that suits her career goals, and that suits that that gives her the kind of opportunity to take her place 
at conference tables, and maybe even boardrooms across American business. What would be an example of those types of job and the wages that you would as the minimum wages that you would associate with those that skill level? Well, that's very hard to tell because you know in New York you get paid a lot more than you get paid in in um, let's say in San Diego. Okay, so it depends on where we are talking about. But what I'm looking at is to get these women into just under middle management level. And then grow into middle management and possibly upper management. Training and background, their expertise with um, through the military experience will should help them to excel, um, especially when the within a corporate environment because they come with such um, incredible training and experience. Exactly. However, and there is the problem, and this is exactly where we come in, uh, and this is where we focus us uh, on our focus operation we met on. It is one thing to succeed in the military, but to translate those skills into civilian world is very, very difficult. It's What's the biggest challenge? People don't understand what does a gunnery sergeant do if, if I tell Al McMichael, our executive director, who is the 14th sergeant major, now retired, of the, of the U.S. Marine Corps, what a gunnery sergeant does, he knows, oh my god, I'm ready to hire that person. But if I tell that to a corporate headhunter or somebody in human resources, they will not, they will not know what to do with that person. What is the skill level of that person? That they probably think security. <laughs> you know, that, that they, they have no concept unless they've been exposed. Exactly. But the thing is, so what we are doing is uh, preparing her uh, to go from the military into the civilian workforce. And it is a long process, and it has many, many different aspects to it. It's multi-tiered, it's complete, and it actually begins even before they leave the military. So what is the biggest challenge internally with women vets as they prepare for that transition? Uh, internally, you know, I, um, I am not a psychologist. And, or a I mean, I'm, let, let, me put, let me rephrase it. With the services that Operation Reinvent provides, what's the starting point for the women in the, that are part of your program? You're going to smile at this. The starting point is a hair and beauty makeover. And you know why? Because it shows, firstly, these women had to suppress their femininity for as long as they have been in active duty number one. So having a beauty and hair makeover professionally done signals that that world is behind you and you're now embarking on an entirely new world. And you're now getting in touch with your femininity which is where you're going to be living in in the civilian world. You're not going to be one of the guys. You're going to be a strong woman, a strong civilian woman. So the first thing that we do, once we, uh, once we uh, go through the application process, because this is not going to be for everybody, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have the resources right now to, um, to accept everybody, and even down the road, we might not have the resources. This is not an inexpensive program that we are proposing here. It is, a, um, it, it is going to be, um, um, it has so many facets to it, uh, but the first one is this makeover, and that signals change and moving forward. So you, uh, you're you beyond the proposal stage in so many regards because last fall you kicked off yes. a makeover with Operation Reinvent in San Diego, California. Can yes, you talk to us about that? Because we have that video on sylviaglobal.com um, under Julie LeWitt. Um, the viewers can see the that experience, but can you share with those who have not yet seen that, um, you know, where you, what you did? It was amazing. Absolutely yeah, it was amazing. amazing. It was amazing. It was so exciting. I tell you, it was so exciting. We had 25 women 
actually 23 because two opted out um, for their personal reasons. And we did hair and beauty um, makeover. Um, Fantastic Sam's came in with 10 operators doing the hair, and Stila Cosmetics came in with six operators doing um, beauticians doing the makeover part, the beauty makeover. There were tears, there was joy, there were um, women felt that they were able to reconnect with their femininity. They felt that they, they felt cared for, they felt loved, they felt that this was amazing. I mean, I cannot tell you, it was the biggest high that I've had in the longest time. I was like, oh my God, I, I was giddy. They were giddy. We were all giddy. Because it was a dream come true for you as it, well, especially in a very short period of time. We pulled that off, I tell you, in nanoseconds because we got the invitation from Reboot Workshop, which is a wonderful organization, to do the, this was their very first all women, all women veteran uh, and soon to be veteran workshop. And so we moved in there and um, it was amazing. It was amazing. So you have to take a look at the video. It's on operationreinvent.org. It's on the landing page. Now you have other experiences that you will be offering to select women vets. How do they get selected? Okay. And what are those experiences that you'll be sharing through your broadcast on op, with Operation Reinvent here on Sylvia Global Network? Okay, well, uh, basically, I'm going to do this very quickly because I don't want to take all of your time today. But um, it starts. Uh, w there's an application process, and they, the women have to show a, a real commitment to the program of being part of it for a, a length of time, and they also have to show a commitment to actually work on on a career orientation. So they want to that they really want to uh, have a great job, and they want to have a career. So uh, the first thing that happens is that they um, there's an application and we call them and we say hello here we are who are you and we talk to them so that it's a very personal very hands on type of, of of program and we introduce ourselves and we tell them what to, what we expect of them and what they can expect from us then comes that if once they are then you know, we agree that this is a great fit. And we can really be of help, and they um, and they feel that we can be of help. Then, uh, boom, operation mm -hmm. makeover. Then comes the the project makeover. So they get the makeover, and immediately get assigned a peer to peer mentor. Who is going operation to reinvent on air? Who are some of the guests and some of the topics that you'll be bringing to? Uh, women in general, but especially targeting women in the uh, military and those transitioning out. Well, I am going to be bringing on uh, probably uh, women beauty salon owners who are participating in this. I'm going to bring in uh, women veterans who are part of the program. I'm going to bring in people who are supporting us. Uh, I'm going to be bringing in uh, my co-workers. I'm going to be bringing in um, more and more women veterans as they are actually going through the process. So you can see a timeline of what is happening to them. Um, and probably some mystery guests. So I think you have some mystery guests that are also going to be a lot of fun for viewers to tune in. Yes. Julie, welcome to Sylvia Global Media Network. We're extremely um, excited about the information and the resources, the tips and the tools that you're bringing to women in general and especially to honor um, women veterans. Thank you so much. And you can see Julie Lewitt. She'll be launching her show here at Sylvia Global in February. And she'll be on um, sylviaglobal.com. You can watch her live. You can connect with her through sylviaglobal.com. And I've been your host, Gail Sylvia, here at Sylvia Global Media. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. I'm so excited. Thanks, Julie, so much for caring. Thank you.